Today we'll be looking at uh, chapter three of the book, which is about uh, the beta binomial variation model. So I'll kind of go through the learning objective. For the learning objective, we will learn how to interpret and tune a continuous beta pro model to reflect your pro information about uh, the pi. We also learn how to interpret and communicate features of pro and posterior model using properties such as mean, mode, and uh, variance. Uh, also, we are going to construct the fundamental beta binomial model for, for proportion that is a pro, which is a pi. Then uh, from the book, they kind of like said that uh, we are going to be making use of some key uh, concepts like the pi, the alpha, and also the beta. And uh, in the book, the packages in which we'll be using uh, for this chapter three, we'll be using the Bayes rules uh, package and also uh, the tidyverse uh, package, which is, those are the two key libraries uh, in which uh, we'll be using uh, for demonstration for this chapter. So, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to know like, uh, what is uh, the book kind of cell like, uh, an idea about uh, what is this uh, beta uh, binomial model. So it's kind of say like the, it is a model we use when we want to uh, look at something that has to do with uh, proportion. And in the book, they kind of like, uh, they give an example of instances whereby this uh, beta binomial model can be used. And the first example, they say the proportion of people that use public transit uh, the proportion of trains that are delayed, the proportion of people that prefer cats to dog, and so on. Um, and also another example in which uh, they gave in the book is about uh, election, that like, like the initial election in US, they gave uh, the probability of her winning the election, which is the pro information. So like the better binomial model provide the tools we need to study the proportion of interest, which is the pi in each of these uh, settings. So for the better pro models, first of all, in this uh, section, in this uh, 3.2, what's actually in the book, what they, uh, they were explaining in this section is like, I uh, will make instances of the uh, election in Minnesota about uh, Mitchell's elections, and they give us some kind of pro information where they specify that the probability, they make an example opinion of 30 uh, opinion polls. They gave uh, Mitchell's support was generally 45%, but later on the proportion uh, was a kind of low, which is 35% that is in the bad day. She's going to pull 35%, but in the good day, she's going to have a 55%. This, this, uh, what, these are the pro information in which uh, they were able to derive from the model. Because just as you explained in the, in the previous chapter, that in the variation uh, approach, we need to have the pro, pro information. From the pro information, we're going to collect uh, some new data. So those new data is going to lead us uh, into uh, uh, the posterior is going to, we are going to derive uh, the posterior from there. So here, these percentages in which uh, they are kind of giving us like is the raw information which is going to uh, lead us to generate uh, the posterior knowledge. So are we good up to these points before I proceed? Okay, so, so how has the model changed from uh, last week? So they also uh, uh, did some kind of example uh, using the Kasparov's probability of beating a deep blue chess was a discrete example. So in this case, the value of pi is going to range uh, between 0 0.2 to 0 0.8, which is the pro knowledge, is going to range between 0 0.2 to 0 0.8. But however, in the reality, Mitchell's election supports and Kasparov's chess skill, which is pi, can be 
any value between zero and one. So that is what they explain in the book that the plot information must always range between zero and one. It can be 0 0.2, it can be 0 0.5, it can be either 0 0.8. So the probability density function for the continuous model rather than probability mass function of the discrete model. So we are going to see that in the next slide. So the next slide here in the book, they kind of explain that what quality does the probability density function have? So the first instant here, they, they said the probability push, the proportion has to be greater than or equal to zero. So it must range between uh, zero and one. Then the second instance, they say the area under the curve must sum up to, to one. And also the area under the curve between A and B sums to the probability of pi being in that range. But in this second instance, I think this one was not still clear to me. I don't know if anybody, they said the area under the curve sums to one. It's not clear. I don't know if Jabi can jump in. Can you repeat the question again? Okay, they say what quality does the probability density function have? I think this, I think they say the area under the curve sums to one. The area under the curve sums to one. Yes, the probability density function, because you have, essentially it's like an integral of, of the area under the curve and the integral of all of that has to sum to one. That's the difference between a discrete and a continuous model. Yes. Um, so, so when you have um, a continuous model like this one, you're estimating like um, the probability between two values. So, for example, between x point x equal point two and x equal point five. So, the area under under those two x values is gonna be like let's say I don't know. 0.25, right? So that's going to be the proportion. You are estimating that shaded area under that. So always, 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 it must sum to one. Um, the proportion has to be greater than or equal to zero. Yes, because um, you cannot have a proportion of negative values. That just doesn't make sense. Yes. And the area under the curve between A and B sums to the probability of pi being the range. But this is for the... Um, for the beta probability, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for that. I think I will go to the next slide. Okay, yeah, tune in the beta real model. I think that in the book, they kind of explain that uh, this is a process of what trial and error because we are going to try different approach before we arrive at the results. So we are the, in the book, they kind of they use uh, this function, the plot underscore beta function that is coming from the Bayes rule package. So they, they supply the basis uh, of the plot, which is can range between 45 for the alpha and also the beta. So once they plot that, it's going to give us uh, this distribution. We are going to derive this distribution, which here in the x-axis is going is showing us uh, is showing us the value of the pi, which is it's showing us the value of the pi, I think, uh, which range I think is around uh, 0 0.5, which is around 50% 50, 50 of, 50, between 50 uh, to 55% uh, percent, uh, of the people that support, that do support that uh, Mitchell is going to, uh, to win uh, the election. I think, yeah, the likelihood, the likelihood of her winning the election is quite, uh, is, is quite a uh, good high. So in this other section, I think it's talking about uh, the, the binomial data model. And also we we'll, we'll also look at uh, the likelihood. So this is where we gather some new data by conducting an opinion poll. On this occasion, they, they look, they ask 50 people, who are they going to support? And 30 of them do agree. Oh, one, yes. one quick thing, can we just go back a little bit? So the oh. first part that you were discussing is the, the, the beta model, 
the beta distribution for the prior. Yeah, yes. that's great. I think that I just want to make a point so that we all understand because this is this is sometimes like the tricky part, right? We're trying to um, to get the posterior, and the only way that we're going to do that is by getting the prior and the yeah. likelihood. Because when we combine those two, based on the uh, base uh, theorem or the base equation, when we combine the prior and the likelihood, then that's going to give us the posterior. Yes. So yes. we have to start with the prior. And just so that we are all on the same page, yes. the prior, because what we are trying to estimate or what we're trying to describe is that what is the probability of getting successes, right? Because the beta distribution, like you mentioned, goes from zero to one. Yes. And it describes um, it's described by two hyperparameters, which are going to be alpha and beta, which are that 45 and that 55. Yes. Those are the parameters that, like, when we have the normal distribution, we have the mean and the standard deviation. So that's going to control the center and the spread of the, of the distribution. In this case, we have alpha and beta, which are that 45 and 55. So when we have, for example, that alpha is one and beta is one, we have the uniform distribution or the beta is similar to the uniform distribution in the sense that it's just one line. Like um, the, the, the function crosses y on one and then just follows along for any value of pi, the, the y is going to be one always. And that can be understood as, yeah, exactly there. So it's going to be on one, and it's going to be just like a straight line. And that can be understood as it doesn't matter the probability of success, which is pi, right? Pi is the probability of success. It doesn't matter what your probability of success you will always get the same value across, right? So it's gonna be like that constant. So in this sense, um, we're trying to see how many people are going to vote for Michelle, that's our success. And that's why we chose a beta distribution to describe that prior, because we could have chosen, there are, so many distributions, right? But the reason why we chose the beta, well, the authors, we didn't do that, right? The author of the book, the authors of the book did that, is because it can give us, it, it can give us this, um, I hope I'm, I'm explaining this correctly, or not correctly, but like, so that everybody can understand, right? So that, because we have, we want to estimate this, this parameter, this pi, that it's the probability of success. Oh, yes. In this case, the, the successes are going to be um, people who vote for Michelle. So that makes sense for our example. So we always have to think about our prior in order to choose what distribution will explain whatever it is that we're trying to describe. I hope that makes sense. So, so choosing the prior is key. That's, that's, I guess that's why I'm, 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 I sort of interrupted you. I'm so sorry, Olof, 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 Yes. I'm so sorry for interrupting you. I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. Choosing the prior is key. So in this case, well, it makes sense to choose the beta because of those, um, of those uh, characteristics that the beta distribution has. And they chose the 45 and the 55 because it's simple. So that, that would be like a, something called informed prior in the sense that we put values in, in the hyperparameters, which are alpha and beta, because we know based on, on these 30 polls that we made and we, we, we did one poll and then we have Oh, well, these are our results. Then we did another one. Oh, these are results. So based on those 30 like polls, random polls that we did, we sort of know how the, um, the, the, 
the tendency looks like, if you will. And this one, this prior, when it has the 45 and the 55 for the hyperparameters, that's how it looks like as the tendency. That's why we chose that one instead of, a, I don't know, 30, 20, like an alpha of 30 and a beta of 20, right? That's why we chose that one. I hope that makes sense. I'm so sorry yes. for interrupting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that input. I think we are all here to also learn. <laughs> Thank yeah, you very okay. much. Yeah, I hope that helped. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think yeah, I was trying to say that uh, uh, we need, we we do have to do another opinion poll to collect some new data where I think uh, 50 people are are supporting. We asked 50 people about who are they going to support in the election, and 30 of them. I do agree that they are going to vote for uh, Mitchell. So if uh, we look at uh, the distribution, uh, uh, the binomial data model and their likelihood, so when we have 10, when we have 10 percent of the people that are going to uh, vote for Mitchell, we can see that uh, the likelihood of yeah, the, it looks uh, very small for, for the top year from the 10% uh, to 30%, the likelihood uh, it looks uh, very small. But as uh, the number of people that are going to support Mitchell uh, begins uh, to go up, we can see that the likelihood of, of her making success, we can see that it's going to go up. When it is 50, 50% 50 that supports uh, Mitchell, we can see uh, the likelihood for her winning that election begins uh, to go begins to what go up. But when it is uh, 60% from here, we can see that the chance of her winning that election uh, is very high here. But going over to here to 70%, it was still okay. But as the, the, we approach 80 to 90%, I think uh, the, the likelihood of her winning, it begins to drop again. It drops at this point. So, uh, when we now look at the plots, when we now look at uh, the uh, the likelihood function, when we look at the we, we visualize uh, the plots, we can see that uh, for her to win that election, it's going to rely the the for the probability of her winning the election is going to lie around I think around fifty five percent, close to fifty five percent. She have a very high chance at that point. To, of winning the election. I don't know if it is clear up to you now, or- Is this the, um, this is the likelihood being the probability of observing the data that we did under the prior? Yes, yes. Okay. Right, right. Yes, so now we are constructing the likelihood, right? Because we already dealt with the prior, so now let's go to the likelihood. And the likelihood is based on the data. And the, the, what we're trying to sort of estimate or understand with the likelihood is the, is the parameter because the, the data stays fixed always with the likelihood. Yes. So you will always have that data, that's it. So now let's work on the, which is what all of them is, is explaining right now, right? We're trying to understand the value of pi, what, what so that we can have the distribution because we're dealing with distributions. The likelihood is going to be a distribution. The prior is also a distribution. So, so that we can. Right. But I was, I was just thinking about that previous uh, graph. Just want to, this isn't the probability of Michelle winning. This is, this is constructing yes. a likelihood. This is, yes. it's, so it's not the, uh, it's a probability of observing the data under the prior, right? It's not the posterior. Oh, it is not like the, Probability of Michelle winning. So what what these these graphs are saying is that based on the data that we collected, well that these people collected, I'm gonna say we, but you know what I mean. So based on the data that we collected, we have we know that 30 percent, not 30, 30 people out of 50, because they polled 50 people. That's why the the first hyperparameter here yeah. is 50. So that's the number of trials. So that 50, we know that 30 out of those 50 
were successes because they voted for Michelle. So we know that that is the, um, so that's the data that we're dealing with, right? Yes. When we, so what you're seeing here is the distribution of a, a binomial distribution with a fixed number of trials. But if how it would look like if we vary the high, the, the hyperparameter, right? The probability of Michelle winning. So if Michelle had a 10% chance of winning, this is what the distribution would look like. But we know that this is not close to what we had with our data. So that yeah. distribution yeah. doesn't look like our, like our data. We cannot pick it. How do we know that? Because what Olawafemi was explaining, right? Because that point is our data. And that point needs to be that 30, right? That needs to be on the higher part of the, of the distribution because it's the maximum likelihood, right? So this one doesn't look like our data. So our, our parameter cannot be 0.1. Our parameter cannot be 0.5 either because this does not look like our distribution, like our data, sorry. But when we get to 0.6, like the parameter being 0.6, that looks like our data. How do we know that? Because the that 30, the, the probability of having 30 people out of those 50 being successes is right here at the peak of the of the distribution. It's the maximum value that we could have. That looks like our like our data. So that's why we pick that one. Clearly, we never do this in real life, right? There are other ways, but for this example. That's how we we went with that one. Is that is that is that clear for everyone? Yeah, I, yeah. Did I explain sorry. that correctly? It's totally clear to me. Um, I was I was just a bit confused because I think I uh, I heard that uh the it was like the probability of, of Michelle winning. But I'm like, oh, but far ahead. But no, I, I was I'm, I was trying to just be sure that we're talking about the probability of the data under the prior. So yeah, no, no, that's all fine. Okay, maybe I explained that incorrectly, but I, I based on what I read, that's how I understand it. Yeah, 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 thanks. Because the likelihood has to look like our date. I mean, that's what we're doing here. It has, why are we picking that, uh, those hyperparameters for that distribution? Because, because of that. Um, I think it's also on the book. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, all good. Sorry, I didn't want to uh, like pause the, <laughs> Uh, cause too much of a tangent. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's the other. That's the other uh, poll that uh, Olawafemi had exactly right. Like the second one, when y equals thirty, which means the um, uh, Michelle selection support pi given the observed poll in which y equals 30 of n 50. So that's the, the one that looks more like our data. That's why that's the one, the, 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 the hyperparameters that we have to pick, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, that one. Okay. But continue, continue this. Um, okay. So yeah, we are going to look at uh, the beta posterior model for this section. So yeah, we talk about, we now have two pieces of our Bayesian model in place. The beta prior model for natural supports, which is a pi, and the binomial model for the dependence of pooling data, which is y on pi. So here we have our model, y, which, uh, I uh, forgot which I think this is the, is it uh, dependent on pi tilde bin of 50 and also pi. Then this is our pi tilde, uh, tilde beta. Uh, we have the alpha and our beta, which is 45 and 55. Then the prior, that, the prior and data as captured by the likelihood don't completely what agree according to what they said in each book. 
constructed from old polls, the Bureau is a bit more pessimistic about Mitchell's election support uh, than the data obtained from the latest poll. Yet, both insights are available to our analysis, just as much as should, should not ignore the new poll in favor of the old. We also should not throw out our bank of prior information in favor of the newest thing. Thinking about uh, this, uh, we they, they run this uh, visualization whereby they have our likelihood in the x-axis, then we have our pro, our pro information, we have our likelihood, but here the posterior, uh, the posterior was at very small. The posterior, we, the posterior was very small because the posterior model of pi along with the scale likelihood function of a given new model result in y is equals to what 30, which is a normal sample size we work because 30 people have already uh, agreed that they are going to vote for Michelle out of the 50. So in the model, what, what, uh, what we are missing in this model is our, our posterior. So what is missing in this model is the posterior information. That is what is missing in this model. So in the second example, which plot reflects the correct posterior model of Mitchell's election support for pi. So we have A for A, there we have the posterior. We also have the scale likelihood, uh, the, uh, the scale likelihood and also the posterior information. We also have this for B. We also have uh, this, the distribution for the B, example B and also example C. So from what they explain in the, in the book, that are the best model that capture the correct major election supports, I think uh, they do agree that is, uh, is the B, because if you look at, if we look at the B, if we plot the beta binomial uh, for that example, we can see that the posterior, uh, which is the new knowledge in which we are getting from the data in which we collect, it's, it is quite high, which is uh, higher than even the pro information that we have, that we have that uh, Michelle is going to, uh, to win the election. So they, they do agree that uh, the, because this posterior value is quite high, so they do agree uh, that this, this is the best model that was able to explain the Michelle election uh, supports. They say the pro, Feed probability uh, density function, scale likelihood function, and posterior probability density function of measures election support, which is a uh, pi. I don't know. That is what I got for this part. I don't know any comments or inputs before I proceed. I think that was great, actually. You've been doing a much better job than me with slides and stuff. I think, I think this was great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy you and do slides, pretty slides like the ones that you did for, for my future um, presentations because I've been lacking and you just, you did a great job. The only thing that I wanna point out here is something very interesting that um, I don't I don't remember if they explained it or not in the book, but do you see how here, so the prior just says prior, posterior just says posterior, but for the likelihood, it says scaled in parentheses, but they're not explaining why. I don't remember if they did, maybe, maybe they did. But the reason why that is, is because if we go back to your previous plot, you're going to see that when we are doing um, when they are when they are doing the um, the just the likelihood plot, what they have in X is going to be the number of successes, right? That's X. Yes. So it's going to be thirty. If you if you go back to um, so it's not this one in the book, oh, the one that has all the multiple plots, the one that we were discussing with all the little plots, the gray plots, 
Yeah, that one, that one. C on the X axis, because again, the likelihood here is based on the data. And the data here, it says that should be, um, actually, I don't know why it says Y here. Oh, why? Because that's the, um, they define this as Y. But yeah, so the, um, the X axis, it just says Y. But that's because that the number of people that are voting for Michelle. So that's number of people. That's why when we scale it and we do like the mean minus the, I think, I think this is why it says scaled. So we cannot compare it in this scale because this is number of people like 30, that's 30 number, 30 people. That's zero, zero people that voted for Michelle. 50 means 50 people that voted for Michelle number of successes, right? So we cannot compare this with the prior, which is in zero to one, and the posterior, which is in zero to one, right? That's the scale. So we have to scale this, the likelihood, to using like the regular way of scaling things, right? Like the data minus the mean divided by the central deviation. I think um, they, they say in the book, so from, from this plot to the next one, I think they take the proportion, so like the 0.1 to 0.9. Oh, sorry, scroll up a bit. Uh, the plot of the likelihood. Um, it was further up. It was just after the one that you had just showed us. Oh, Maybe on the previous one. Okay. Um, then, then apologies for repeating that. Just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. That that's why it's scaled. Yeah. And that's why we can compare it. Yeah, so the scaling isn't isn't uh, in terms of like the mean and that the scaling is to ensure that the it integrates to one. Ah, so they didn't do it. See, yeah, it's not not the horizontal scaling. Uh, so and the, ah, horizontal the, scaling. Ah, okay, okay. It's it's not like um, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and to get yeah. from that like plot that we had the the facet graph to the plot of the likelihood. I think they're plotting on the x-axis, the prior, which is like the, the 0.1 to the 0.9, and the y-axis is the value mm. under our data. On the, so the, the f of the y given the prior. Um, OK, OK, OK. Okay, I see that. I see. Is it this? Not this. I think we are. Yeah, here. yeah. So here. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so see how the like um the first plot is like binomial of like 50, to, 50 with a proportion of 0 0.1, and the next is yeah, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Yeah. So that 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0.3 becomes the x axis of the next plot. And the yes. y-axis of our data, the black point, is the y-axis of the next plot. So you scroll down a bit to the next plot. We, we see the nine points that were the same from our facet graph above. And the y-axis is taken for just our points. But then this uh, is scaled so that the area under the curve is equal to one in terms of plotting it alongside our prior and posterior. Uh, yeah, posterior. Yep. Okay. Yes, okay. I see that now. Ah. Okay. Yeah, I just did like a control F and found where they mentioned scaling on the uh, on the book. I was like, and, uh, why are they putting that there? Yeah. Okay, so do you have something else that we continue that, so that we can continue? Yeah. Yes. I think uh, where are we? Yeah, we are here. I think we are true with this slide because we said this is the plots best the best uh, among the three example we showed that this is the best. Models so they went over to effect of new data. That is, if they collect uh, new data, so they just use uh, this summarize 
beta binomial, whereby they give it the alpha, which is always, which is 45, beta 55. Then the number of people that are supporting Michelle to win, which is 30. Then there's the number of the total number of people that were the opinion pool were conduct the sample size, which is uh, 50. So when they plot, when they, they output from the model, we have, we already know that our prior, our prior information, the mean was 0 0.45, which was 45%. So the posterior, which is the new knowledge in which they were, the posterior went up to 50% of people uh, that are going to support uh, Michelle that she's going to win the election. But if you look at uh, in the outputs, the value of the standard deviation, it went uh, from 0 0.049 to I think uh, 0 0.040. So it was able to it shrink a little bit. The, that is the variability. It, it went uh, down from 0 0.049 Nine, it went down to, I think, uh, 0.040 uh, from that, that. So now in this example, we are going to see how we can do some simulation. We are going to run some simulation using uh, the, this R beta function that is coming from uh, base R. So we want to run simulation for 10,000 uh, data points. We already know the value of our alpha, which is 45, our beta, which is 55. Then we just mutate, which is coming from the tidy vest. Then the value of the Y, we are using the R by norm function from also uh, the base R. So the, this by R by norm function, uh, we want to create a random, number of 10,000 random data points. So of 10,000, the size is 50 because the entire sample size uh, was 50. Then the prob probability should be what pi. So when we visualize this uh, using ggplot2, uh, we are going to get uh, these outputs. Uh, we are going to get this output, which shows uh, that between 0.4, uh, to around 0.6% uh, uh, percent of the people, uh, which shows that among all, among those uh, probability of success, the total of, I think, 30 people do agree uh, that uh, they are going to support uh, Mitchell uh, for the election that she, she is going uh, to win uh, that election, which is what we are seeing here. But, they went further in the book to, to filter out for all the value of y that is equals to 30. Then they assign that to a new object. Then they will look at the head of that object. We can see that we have pi and we have the value of y. So when we now uh, visualize this, when we now visualize this uh, to see uh, the distribution, and this is actually uh, uh, the distribution of what we are seeing in the previous plot. This is actually uh, the distribution. Uh, this is uh, the probability of the success, which is in, is in the x-axis. And we, we can see the uh, distribution, which went, uh, which shows, which went from this point uh, to this is likely, I, I, uh, let's say is we want to look look as if it is a, like a bell something bell curve shape or I think somehow bell curve shape. This is a density. But if we now look at uh, this, when we now get we use the summarize, we can look at the mean. For this is uh it is zero point five zero and also the standard deviation which is similar uh, to what we have which is similar with the one we have in the previous uh, slide that I showed, uh, which is similar to what we have in the previous slide here. It's similar to what I showed here in the previous slide, which is similar to what we, what we have here. Because here, 
the mean was 0 0.44 uh, for the prior, for the mean was 0 0.45 for the prior and the posterior, the mean went to 0 0.50. But if we compare that to this, the mean is now uh, 0 0.50 and the standard deviation is uh, 0 0.041, is similar to what we have in the previous slide. So uh, this uh, is about another study in which uh, the, another example in which uh, they also gave in the book, which is about the milligrams behavior study of obedience. And this study, this is a famous study where the subject were asked to deliver an electric shock to an actor under the rules of a study on the effect of punishment on memory. In reality, what was being tested was obedience to authority and the conflict with personal conscience. So when we now look at what we have, what do you think the pro belief we are first given the beta, which is one and 10, which is alpha and beta, pro model that does, that does that reveal what does that reveal about the psychologist's pro understanding of the path? That is the probability of success. First, they do explain that they don't have an informed opinion about, they don't have an informed opinion. They are fairly certain that a large proportion of people will do what authority tells them. That is whatever whatever thing in which the authority say, if they say do this, so that is what uh, they are going to do. The third option there is that they are fairly certain that only a small proportion of people will do what authority tells uh, them to do. So, so when we now look, let's plot them to find out. When we now plot this with the plots underscore beta function, from the Bayes rule package. Here we supply the alpha to be one and also the beta to be 10. And we are going to come up with this distribution. And this shows that less uh, around uh, less than 0.25% uh, of the people, less than uh, 0. 0.25% of the people, uh, less than 0.25% of the people are going to, we have the likelihood of less than, the likelihood, okay, sorry, the likelihood was less than 0.25% of the people. The likelihood was 0.25% of the people that are going to do what uh, authority instruct them uh, to do. So, so what actually happened is that Obedience to authority stands out. So that is what actually we saw from the book, Obedience to Authority, won out. The pro was not supported by obedience. The pro information, it was not supported by obedience. Uh, the data collector showed that 26 out of 40 participants inflicted the maximum electric shock, which is what we saw from the graph in which I showed, it shows that uh, 26 out of 40 participants inflicted uh, the maximum electric uh, shock. So what conclusion uh, in a, can we draw from that is that our prayer, though they started out uh, with, an, uh, with an understanding that fewer than 25% of people will inflict the most service shock data from the data given the strong counter evidence in the study area why for the posterior they now understand that this figure to be somewhere between 30 and 70 percent so for the new knowledge they now understand that it's going to be around uh, this uh, range which is from 30 to 70 percent so in this 3.18, so we, we just look at the plot of the prior, the likelihood are alongside uh, with the posterior from the model using uh, a new function, which is plot underscore beta from the base rule package. 
Then here the alpha is, is one, the beta is 10, the y, our y, because it was 26% of success, so it's 26. Then the sample size uh, was 40. So when we run that, we are going to have uh, this distribution, which shows which, which is going to show us uh, the prior, uh, the posterior, and also uh, the scaled, uh, the scaled uh, likelihood. And from this uh, graph, I don't know, I, I don't know if I, because this is not still clear, I don't know if David can further ex help me exp expand on this. I don't know if anyone else wants to take a stab at it because I've, I feel like I've talked too much. I don't want to, you know, if nobody wants to talk. Are we just playing around with the priors and new data to see how it moves things around, right? I mean, it's pretty similar to the last experiment. It's just a uh, different prior, different, different data observed. I think this is a good example. I like this example because, well, not necessarily the example, but I like that the authors chose something like this example so that we know that even though when we're, because we were discussing in the first chapter, I think the balance between the prior and the, and the likelihood and the data, right? To inform the posterior, there's always a balance. So which one is going to influence more the posterior? And I think this is a good example. If your prior is weak or very far from, from your data, then it's your, your data is going to inform more the posterior. So the posterior is going to look more like the data, right? So, so I, think, I think it is a good example of that. I don't know if you guys see it that way too, or maybe I'm just looking at this the wrong way, but I think that here, the data is, is strong because I think they collected, I don't remember exactly how much, but they have a lot of data. And that's what it's informing the posterior a lot, even though the prior is rare. I mean, it's not really informing much. It's not saying much. I suppose it's, it's saying like only one, what was the prior saying? Only one person was going to. In beta model with what, like, Alpha of one and beta of ten will be. Yeah, uh, one out of ten, right? One. Yeah. And the but but the data was saying that it wasn't gonna be like that. It was um. Twenty six out of forty. Yeah. Yeah, twenty seven out of forty, and the posterior yes. then ends up looking more like the likelihood. Well, balance between them, but it, it looks more more like the likelihood, like the data, like what the data was saying. So I like that because in reality, this is obviously already a worked example, etc. But in reality, when we're, I was just having this discussion with someone this week. In reality, how do we, because it's, it's the choosing the priors that is sometimes tricky, right? Because you have data that you're gonna fit to the model. Then you, see, you start thinking, okay, what prior do I use? Okay, let's say I use a binomial or a uniform distribution or something like that. And then what parameters are, am I gonna put in the prior? So am, am I gonna go with an uninformed prior? Am I gonna go with carefully selecting my values? And in the end, I think if you have a lot of data, that's what's gonna end up informing the posterior. So the prior, even though if you didn't have much information to, to pick a very good informed prior, in the end, it won't matter because it's your data that's going to really put all the muscle into the posterior. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So because I, I, I always, I never know, I always second guess myself, I guess, with the priors. I always, I'm always like, oh my God, are these good priors for this? Should I have picked other values for the priors? Or I don't know, because I'm not, I'm not very experienced at this, right? I'm, I'm, really just starting my Bayesian journey. So, so I, I don't know, that's, I was just sort of thinking maybe discuss that a little bit, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> OK. 
Okay, I think let's proceed. Okay, summary. So, so far, so good. I think we, we built a better binomial model for unknown proportion anywhere between uh, zero and one. We have seen that like every Bayesian analysis, beta binomial model have four common elements. So we are going to beta binomial model. It has a prior, we have a data model. It also has the likelihood function and also uh, the posterior uh, model. I think that is, uh, that is all I have uh, I got from the chapter. That is all I got. Others is meeting videos. Oh yeah, and now ours is gonna be there. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Lower Family. This was great. I did such a bad job last week, but you <laughs> you just great, great, great. Because anyway, so for next week. We are moving on to chapter four. Yeah. Yeah, chapter four. So it's going to be, um, I don't, oh, no, no, no. We're not meeting next week. Or are we meeting next week? Yeah, not Hi, meeting Matthew. next Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Matthew. Sorry for um, jumping on this call. I know it's strictly for core three. I uh, wanted to read the base book, but uh, it's, been, it's been like a talk of war because I started at some point, but then I stopped. Uh, so I realized that this time um, for this particular course might work for me. And I saw you guys have done like three chapters ahead, although I have not caught up with the three chapters you guys have taken already. Am I audible? Like, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you. So um, I'm really sorry if I jumped into your call without um, taking permission or without letting the facilitator of the um, <laughs> the facilitator know. So um, well, I would go back and check the last three videos. Actually, I've not done that. Uh, just to make sure I have the reminder to tell me okay when exactly uh this um call to be having their meeting. So I just came in today, but everything here still looks kind of uh, a bit complex. Not so clear yet, so I think I need to do um, a full work. But if I, I still can't catch up, I think I'll just let this board be and wait till the next board. Uh, my name once again is Matthew. It's quite dark here, so I would have um, turned on my video. Matthew, no, I mean, you're welcome to join us anytime. You can skip some chapters and you can come back. If something doesn't make sense, you can sort of interrupt me uh, presentation or whatever, like sort of like what I was doing today, I get sometimes too excited and I I love these things. So I just want to talk about them all the time. So I apologize for that, but um, so you can just jump in and say, listen, I don't understand. What are you talking about, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the idea is that we are um, a learning community, right? So we're here to explain things among among us, right? Like, so if I don't understand something or if I explain something incorrectly, um, then someone else jumps in and just, you know, sort of takes over and explains it better. So, so you're welcome to join us at any time. You don't have to ask for permission or anything like that, but forget it. And if you want to skip some chapters, you're more than welcome. I don't know if there's going to be another cohort though, because we're cohort number three. And as you can see, there's not. You know, it's not like we're 40 people here, right? So um, maybe in a few months, there's gonna be more um, interest in starting a new cohort, then of course that can happen. Um, but I cannot guarantee that, this, that it's gonna be next month or in two months, right? It could be, it could be, but it could not be. So we don't know. We should do a model on that, no, I'm kidding. So, um, so uh, yeah, so if you join us, in, I don't know if you're in the Slack, um, in the R4DS Slack, that's where we put all the information. So I recommend you join that. If you haven't, then um, 
then let me know and then I can give you the link so that you can join. Because we post, oh, fantastic, then, then you're good. Um, so for, if we go to signups for cohort three, so I think next week, yeah, we're not meeting next week. So we're taking a little break. And then we're gonna meet again for chapter four on November 9th. So if nobody signs up for that one, I'll present it myself, right? But I don't know if you wanna, if you want me to keep talking. <laughs> Someone else can present, if not, then I'll do it, of course. I have no problems with that, but it depends on, on, on that. And um, if you have anything else or that you guys want to add, if not, feel free to also, if you have questions or something, DM me in the, um, in the Slack. You can DM me and if you have any questions or something that you want to say there. Thanks, guys. I'm Thank going to head off. Right. I'll see you guys later. You Matt, you wanted to say something? Or Matthew, sorry. Uh, I got the information. It's right away, and uh, I think I get uh, how it works here. Uh, well, this is not my first uh, book club. Uh, it was part of the Alfred, a, a course for Alfred DS. So I kind of got how the whole thing works. Someone could volunteer to present the chapter, and um, from there, you could um, gain from others and get to understand things better. So um, I look forward to learning more from, from everyone here. This, this is my I really don't have experience based uh, data science, but I really want to get how it works and see how I can apply it in agriculture. So, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome anytime. And if you have any questions or something, just let us know. And you can also, um, I recommend you just read the book because it's, it's a good book, I think. Um, some things are not very well explained, but just go through it and, and we're here to, okay. to help anyone if you, in case you need any help or something. Okay. All right. Oh, Femi, you wanted to say something else? No? No. <laughs> okay, good job and thank you for presenting today. Bye guys, see you in two weeks. Okay, bye.